Well, good morning, and I want to big offer a big cheerio to the heroes on our production team who keep us rolling. I think that was pretty impressive, a recovery halfway through a song. <laughs> Don't you reckon? And uh, well done, Karis and the worship team, for keeping us on track uh, when technology was misbehaving. Hey, happy Father's Day. It is great to have you here with us for week three of our Radical series. Uh, in the first week, we talked about radical honesty, and we got the mirror out, and we asked the Lord to search our hearts and reveal anything that's not pleasing to Him. Last week, we talked about radical devotion, and we talked about the pearl of great worth and how easy it is to get sucked into spending our lives on fake pearls. During this last week, we tried some fasting. Anyone give that a go? I'm going to ask for a show of hands if you gave it a go. Fasting or missing out. We've got a few hands here and there. Give it a go. Uh, fasting or missing out. It's not too late to give it a try. So if you haven't had a try, uh, I'd encourage you to try on uh, fasting or uh, going without something for seven days or fasting for 24 hours. I'd, give you, uh, I'd encourage you to have a crack at that. Uh, ask God to sharpen your senses. Ask him to reveal himself to you and incline your heart and soul towards him. Uh, I wonder uh, whether anything came out in the wash for those of you who did give fasting and praying a go. So when we, look, uh, when we fast, we look for God in the discomfort and we train our senses to listen in the hunger vacuum if that's the type of fast you're going for. Apart from the health benefits, the simple act of further attuning our hearts towards God can be profoundly life-changing. I want to encourage you that if you haven't done so already, read the extra resources on the web on me at sb.org.au. Read the resources and have a go at it. It could lead you to some long-term practices that could be life-changing for you. Have a look at it. I'd uh, be really interested to know over the last two weeks uh, what you've noticed about the pushback within you when you hear the invitation to step into radical honesty or radical devotion. What's the pushback? What's the things that we use to say, no, I, I don't think so? What's that voice of dissent internally railing against uh, for these practices and particularly going without uh, in its many forms? We don't like to do that, do we? Let's be honest. Uh, there's something deep within each of us that likes the idea of not only have it, having everything that we need, but everything that we want as well. And when we want is, even when we, what we want is not good for us, it doesn't stop us wanting it. That idea that we talked about last week where we quench our soul thirst with things other than God. I don't know what has come out for the wash, in the wash for you over this past week uh, as you've tried to listen and pray, but this week we're talking about action. And there is talk and there's action, uh, and the next couple of weeks are going to be more about choosing action. The thing about living uh, out our dysfunction and sin is that if we're to be honest, at the end of the day, many of us actually choose that. Many times we seek to blame others for the things that hold us back and that hold us. Uh, it's in our DNA when Adam gets caught out eating the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. It's a classic. He says, the woman you put here, he's referring to God there, with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. In other words, it's the woman's fault for tempting me and it's your fault, God, for giving me this woman. Right from the very beginning, the number one obstacle for repentance seems to be blame. Uh, we try all sorts of things on, don't we? I had a difficult childhood. I can't help it. I'm born that way. My kids used to say it whenever they'd get in trouble. Uh, she made me do it or he made me do it. So we hang on to our excuses, our bitterness, our numbing behaviour, our relational dysfunction because it looks like a way to cope. And we know it, it's not good for us. We might know that it's a sin, uh, but Jesus called people captives for really good reason. And it's because many of us are. But unlike a normal prison where there are chains and locks 
and razor wire, many of us choose to live in prisons of our own design. You can be a prisoner to money and be so determined to find financial security that all you ever think about is incomings and outgoings and it robs you day and night. You know, Jesus said not to worry about money. You know, he said that he, you cannot serve both God and money, but the fear of not having enough just paralyzes you into the night and it keeps you prisoner. You can be a prisoner to numbing behavior. My po poison, as I've spoken of before, was pornography, but it can be alcohol, it can be prescription meds, it can be gambling or overeating, it can be binge watching, uh, Netflix or TV or anything that distracts you and helps you forget pressure. Even though you know the behavior creates its own pressure, the pressure of being a prisoner of your own making uh, and in a prison of your own desire, design actually increases the pain. You can be a prisoner to control, controlling your kids, controlling your spouse, controlling your friends and family, controlling your work and your work colleagues. Being a control freak is a very tiring business. I know that for a fact because there is only one God and you've probably worked it out by now your, it, it isn't you. If control is your drug of choice, you will keep telling yourself, if you can just get control of that one last thing, you'll be able to relax. The dead giveaway is that if you look at the content of your prayers, most of them will be advisory. You telling God what he should do. Trying to control God. No, one, no listening, no responding. Just a shrill set of orders on rinse and repeat. So if you listened, you would know that you're a prisoner of your own making and the prison is control. Prisoners to money, prisoners to work, prisoners to leisure, prisoners to dysfunction and disease, prisoners to bitterness and unforgiveness, prisoners to gossip, slander, to anger, to misery and to blaming others. So many prisoners, so little time. Fortunately... Jesus came to set us free. He, did it. he didn't come to try and comfort us in our sin. He actually came to release us from it. There's a great story in John 5 where Jesus comes across a man who's lying by the pool of Bethsaida. It's a healing pool. And this guy has been unable to move for a long time. And this is Jesus' response to him. Jesus comes to him. And there's one who's there, been there, an invalid for 38 years, long time. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in that condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Weird question, right? But I reckon that's a question uh, in which we can see a rock-solid commitment of God to free will. God wants us to be free. He wants us to live our best lives. But not without us choosing that. Free choice is encapsulated in the question, do you want to get well? You may be enslaved up to the armpits and be keen as mustard for deliverance, but the question needs to be posed, do you want to get well? By asking this question, Jesus honours free will in this man's life. It staggers me that God seems to be committed to our free will above almost anything else. Even to his detriment and ours, we get to choose. And by our choices, we play a pivotal part in our own freedom. So that's where we're going to focus today. What part do we play in being set free? So today we look at a remarkable story of a man who is radically set free by Jesus and a man who clearly participates in his own freedom. We're going to talk about the two-way street that is repentance and healing today. But before we pray, let's, let's, before we do that, let's pray together. Lord, we come before you this morning. And Lord, if we're to be honest, each of us has things that we have not brought before you, whether it's shame or whatever that stops us doing that. I ask, Lord, that you penetrate all of that today, that you'd speak to us where we're at and that you'd help us to see your invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. 
The Oxford Dictionary defines remorse as deep regret or guilt for wrong committed. Uh, Note that it names a feeling more than an action or a behaviour. Remorse is different to the biblical understanding of repentance. Remorse is an emotion that can often lead to repentance, but in and of, of itself, remorse is not repentance. So repentance goes much further than feeling bad. A biblical understanding of repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia, which literally means a change of mind, not about individual plans, intentions or beliefs, but rather a change in the whole personality from a sinful course of action to an action towards God. Repentance starts with the mind, but inevitably it really leads to action. So in today's story, we don't know uh, exactly when it happens, but this is as good an example as you are likely to see or to find in the New Testament of what repentance looks like. I'm going to really quickly outline it. Uh, We'll zip through it, uh, and then we'll talk about it a bit about what it might mean. So as with many people, uh, the repentance journey of Zacchaeus begins with curiosity. So Jesus enters Jericho. He's passing through a man there uh, uh, by the name of Zacchaeus, was a chief tax collector, and he's wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But in short, he, he was short, so he couldn't see over the crowd. I can relate to that. Um, So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore tree to see him uh, since Jesus was coming that way. So scholars universally seem to agree that Zacchaeus needed to climb the tree. It wasn't just about his height, but the fact for him, it was probably the safest place for him to be. Universally hated tax collectors were seen as traitors to their country and dishonest to the core. And he's a little bloke, so he will cop a pasting out in a crowd. So a person who effectively collected tax for Rome and made a fortune off the misery of the people whilst doing it. Zacchaeus was not a popular man, and they reckon he climbed the tree just as much for his own personal safety as he did to see Jesus. He takes a risk. So his curiosity and his sin is what puts him there. Regardless of the risk, regardless of what people might think of him, Zacchaeus takes a significant risk to check Jesus out. I reckon one of the biggest obstacles to connecting with Jesus is the barriers that people create for themselves. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people put a line through themselves because they think that they're too naughty for Jesus. That somehow there's some kind of threshold that Jesus can't pass. I think initially, at least, Zacchaeus is an excellent uh, representation of the average curious person. Close enough to hear and see Jesus, but far enough away to avoid being touched by him. The beauty of this era of podcasts and streaming, of course, is that people can check Jesus out, check church out without risk. They can do it without showing up, but so often without opportunity. Risk, no opportunity. You can do that at church too. You can show up, but keep your distance, if you know what I mean. You know where we treat church like a spectator sport? We kind of show up. uh, We stay lost in the crowd. We need prayer, but we don't ask for it. We need people in our lives, but we don't let anyone get close enough to make a real difference. The very idea of a radical friend, of course, that we spoke about in the first week is outrageous if you don't have any real friends at church. Maybe we think we'll avoid being hurt or disappointed if we stay out of reach. But you know the old saying, no risk, no reward. Zacchaeus takes the risk, he shows up, albeit at a distance. Jesus sees Zacchaeus And it's what he does next that blows people's minds. Jesus, when he reached the spot, looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus came down at once and welcomed him gladly. So the next step that Zacchaeus takes in his repentance journey, and we talked about it last week, is he listens and responds to Jesus. In this unexpected turn of events, Jesus has taken the hospitality, and therefore declared his friendship with the tax collector. No one in the crowd could have been more surprised than Zacchaeus. 
He did not see this coming. But in his embarrassment and delight, he takes his cues from Jesus. He comes down at once. He welcomes him gladly. And nobody sees this coming. And it becomes evident in the very next verse. All the people saw it and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Do do you know who you're having lunch with, Jesus? That is not a good look. So remember we talked about this behavior in week one. The plank and the speck, right? You know, let me help you with that speck. I've got a big plank in my eye. People looking down their nose, not only at Zacchaeus, but at Jesus who decides to hang out with him. These people clearly didn't know Jesus, who, if we read the Gospels, seems to have surprisingly low standards in terms of who he's friends with. You think you're not good enough for Jesus. I want to encourage you to think again. None of us are good enough. Not one. But he seems to love us and reach out to us anyway, and that's what this story is about. Jesus reaches out to Zacchaeus and chose to have a meal with him, which could have been the equivalent, probably in our day, to going to a notorious drug lord's place and having dinner uh, in, uh, at their place. It's not a good look for Jesus, but watch what happens next. Zacchaeus has postured himself to check out Jesus, And to his credit, despite the grumbling of the crowd, he listens to Jesus' invitation, he responds to it. Little does Zacchaeus know that listening and responding to Jesus is going to change everything for him and everything for those around him as well. During dinner, while the crowd is still muttering, Zacchaeus makes a startling statement. But Zacchaeus... And this is in response to that, the crowd muttering. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Zacchaeus listened and responded to Jesus in a small thing, having him over to dinner. I've got no doubt that would have been an honour for him. Maybe Zacchaeus initially had Jesus over to dinner because it was good for his reputation. I don't know. The text doesn't tell us that. But what he announces to everyone at dinner tells us that Zacchaeus is transformed by Jesus. And to be honest, that's where the vast majority of repentance happens. It's in the presence of Jesus that most of us realize how far we have fallen short. And it's in the presence of Jesus that self-righteousness And sin is revealed for exactly what it is. In the presence of Jesus, hearts are transformed and lives are uh, are changed. It's exactly why we've asked you to push harder into listening and responding over the last week. Why we encourage you to sign up for the 24-hour prayer and try out fasting or abstinence. Because it's in the presence of Jesus that our hearts are transformed and our lives are changed. Zacchaeus is a superlative example of radical repentance. For Zacchaeus, it was way above and beyond what he actually uh, would be reasonably expected in that context. Giving half of his possessions to the poor is an impressive gesture in and of itself. But the offer to pay four times what he's gained unlawfully is remarkable. Scholars seem to agree that Zacchaeus could have been much better off to accept the letter of the law in Jewish terms of adding a fifth to whatever he'd stolen, just add a fifth on top of that. But this is radical repentance. So Zacchaeus offers many, many more times than that. Zacchaeus is a picture of true repentance. Once a thief, now a generous benefactor. And honest to the fault in his business dealings. It's a great example of the 180 degree turnaround that the Bible, uh, biblical repentance calls for. Without Jesus, Zacchaeus is an unscrupulous businessman making a fortune off the misery of his people. In the presence of Jesus, things changed. He becomes generous and open-hearted. He becomes honest and wants to make good on his past misdemeanors. Zacchaeus pays a significant price in his repentance. The cost is high. And I reckon the cost is an excellent indicator of the quality of the repentance. So here's the thing. If repentance costs nothing, 
Let me be brave. It means nothing. If it, it, there's no such thing as cheap biblical repentance. If it costs you nothing, it means nothing. Unless there's a change of action to the word sorry. We've all heard uh, an, un, an unacted sorry. If it's attached to the word uh, sorry, if there's no change of action, it's cheap and it means very little. If repentance costs nothing, it means nothing. We've all seen a cheap sorry offered. We've all, uh, we've all seen it. There's nothing repentant about it. A real sorry is linked to repentance and it means a turnaround. And in my experience, the higher the cost of that turnaround, the more likely it is that repentance rather than remorse is in play. We've all seen the person who, who feels bad about what they've done, but nothing is changing. Turn to the person next to you and say it like you mean it. If repentance costs nothing, it means nothing. Go on, do it. You know you want to. <laughs> All right, we're getting too convicted. Let's keep moving. The turnaround for Zacchaeus would have cost him a fortune in time, in energy, and money. The turnaround happened very, very quickly. Today, I give half of my possessions to the poor. His repentance is massive, it's significant, and it's not delayed. Today. It's a nice story, but I've got to tell you, it's a rare one. Very few people pull off radical repentance in one go. There's often a struggle that ensues with choosing repentance. Paul describes it in Romans 7. He says, I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another power within me that's at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. What a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. For lots of us, repentance is a process and the answer is indeed in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let me uh, show you. Uh, I think this belongs to John Tucker, actually. I'll try and be good with it. Uh, unfortunately, many of us think this, and you'll have heard it before, that repentance is a Jesus take the wheel kind of moment, right? We've all heard it. Jesus take the wheel. We think that that's what repentance is. Uh, where we're spiralling out of control, and you know it, and we simply hand the steering wheel over to Jesus, and he sorts it all out for us. No consequences, no responsibility, no change, except that which Jesus makes. The action is all on him. Unfortunately, Jesus take the wheel rules out free will. It does not work. As I said before, God seems to be committed to us at almost any cost. He seems to be committed to this idea of free will. And perhaps a better way of seeing things is Jesus as navigator. Because of free will, we are always, whether we acknowledge it or not, in the driver's seat. Always responsible for choosing. At the end of the day, we always have our hands on the wheel, or sometimes we might not, but... We always have our hands on the wheel and we're always responsible for driving. We listen and respond to Jesus and sometimes we choose to go our own way. Just to take the analogy a little further, more often than not, going our own way leads to a dead end, a road to nowhere. Uh, you know, often you don't realise you're on a dead end road until you reach the end. Reaching the end can be catastrophic where you lose your job or your marriage is destroyed or relationships are horribly damaged. You can even end up in jail if you choose to go the wrong way enough. You can lose your life prematurely if you choose to go the wrong way enough, if your decisions are poor enough. Sometimes... Like Zacchaeus, there can be seemingly a chance meeting with Jesus where he says, come and let us chat together. And in the midst of the chat, you discover there is room to turn around. You actually are not a prisoner 
after all. You know when you turn around down the wrong street and it's a no-through road? What we all want is one of these, right? Where you just turn around in one go and you are on your way. We all like those ones. But many times it looks more like this. Many times it takes a 400-point turn to get around. You know, those narrow streets are particularly bad. The tighter the street, the more difficult it is to turn around. All this to say that with repentance, sometimes it's easy to turn around. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it takes a lot of turns to be free. In my life, it's taken me far more than one shot to eliminate pornography, talking to my mates, putting fences up with accountability software, learning what triggers are and why they were there. Initially, I thought turning around might be a a dead-end court kind of deal where I confess it, turn around in one go. It didn't turn out that way. In fact, it took many, many turns to find my way out of that. Repentance, it must be said, begins in the mind, but it always leads to action. And the longer you have been dysfunctional, the more often than not, the longer it will take to turn around. For you, it might be gossip. It might be fits of rage. It might be dishonesty or lying or lust or greed. Any number of dysfunctional behaviours need time and repeated actions to turn around. For me, it all began with the presence of Jesus calling me to a better standard. Two steps forward, one step back, and there's Jesus showing me how to move forward. Three steps forward, one step back, and there's Jesus showing me how to turn it around. Never taking the wheel. Never taking the wheel, but always giving direction gently and calmly. Hebrews says the same thing in a different way. We do not have a high priest who's unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So sometimes we get around in one, sometimes it takes a few, either way, Grace gives us enough room to turn around. And last time I looked, we all need grace in one form or another. And the closer we get to Jesus, the more we realise how much grace he actually gives us. Years ago, we had a German shepherd called Chili. He was a fantastic dog and trainable in every respect, except digging in the backyard. Chili would dig a hole in the backyard, we'd tell him no, we'd circle him, we'd uh, punish him in some way or another, and he'd be suitably remorseful. Uh, but within days, he'd do it again. The first sign that Chili had moved towards repentance was when we came home one day, and he was standing with his tail between his legs and his ears back and head down low to the ground and uh, at the back door. And I asked him what he'd done. And seriously, he walked me to the hole he'd dug in the backyard. Uh, Now, this isn't chilly, but it's a picture of how doggy repentance looks, owning it. He knew the consequence, but he still owned it. It only actually happened another couple of times, and Chili just stopped digging. Even though he was a dog, I reckon Chili's behaviour outlines how repentance often, more often than not, is a process rather than a one-off event. Repentance begins with owning it. And Zacchaeus firstly owns that he has accepted, he has cheated people and then he acts to reverse it. As a result of Zacchaeus' actions of repentance, Jesus pronounces that salvation has come to his house. But he doesn't just leave it there. Jesus' closing statement is the invitation that changes everything for everyone. Let's have a look at this. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That means you and me. This is a profound mission statement because it opens the idea of being saved to anyone who is lost. And what fascinates me about Zacchaeus' story is that Jesus embracing him is utterly undeserved. He's undoubtedly one of the most despised people in his region, and yet he is so lost 
but Jesus reaches out to him. Being saved isn't just for nice people, shiny people, or good people. Being saved is for anyone who knows they need it. Anyone who is lost. I want to say this morning that's only half the story. Jesus reaching out to save us is one part. But it's in our repentance that the real transformation happens. Really interesting. It's only after Zacchaeus actually enacts repentance that Jesus says salvation has come. He does not pull the trigger until after the action. Very interesting. For those, who, those of us who, who believe in uh, we're saved by grace, not works, that's true. But there should always be a transaction. There should always be a change. I want to say this morning that Jesus reaching out to save us is one part, but then comes free choice. I was paddling down Patterson River a few months ago, and as I was paddling past a boat ramp, a bloke yelled out to me and stopped me. Um, He pointed at a big stalk across the river and... uh, told me that it got tangled in his fishing line. It actually towed his fishing rod across the river. He said, don't worry about the rod. That bird's going to die if you don't free it. So I paddled over and I gently untangled this big bird and it seemed completely undamaged. But but surprisingly, rather than just take off, because it was trying to get away from me when I got to it, it just stood there. So it was free but it seemed unable or unwilling to move. Maybe it was shock, but it took an, actually took at least another hour to take off and make use of its freedom. Believe it or not, Jesus came to seek and save the lost, and that includes you and it includes me. He came to set the prisoners free. The question for each of us is, what am I doing with the freedom that Jesus has offered me? Are we doing a Zacchaeus? Or are we just standing there like a stunned stork? Just standing there, waiting for Jesus to take the wheel or something. The problem is that unlike Zacchaeus, many of us accept Jesus saving us, and then by free choice, we do absolutely nothing with it. Zacchaeus isn't content to just have Jesus visit. Zacchaeus isn't content to just be saved. Repentance. In repentance, he's not content to just confess his sin. In his repentance, Zacchaeus moves to radical action and in doing so, lets Jesus have access and influence to his treatment of the poor and his restoring debt and the reshaping, actually, of his business practices. The untold story is that many, many other people benefit from this tax collector's uh, repentance. People who've been cheated get their money returned and some. People uh, who are poor receive unforeseen financial aid as he gives away half of all he owns. True repentance changes not only our lives, but actually the lives of others. There's an old saying that you can't uh, steer a parked car. My sense is that in Western Christianity, many of us have accepted the cost that Jesus was willing to pay, and many of us have choked on the cost of repentance. What are we willing to pay? It's true, you can't earn your salvation, but boy, can you respond to it. Ask yourself again, what am I doing with the freedom that Jesus has offered me? In Zacchaeus, we see that true repentance is willing to pay almost anything in response to Jesus. Half of his possessions and goodness knows how much in repayments to his debtors. Ultimately, seeking and saving the lost cost Jesus everything. I know it's a confronting question, but I would love you to ask yourself this morning, what's repentance and faith costing me? Seriously. What's it costing me? This morning as we take communion and we recognise the enormous cost that Jesus was willing to pay for our freedom, 
the cracker representing his body given for us, the juice representing his blood poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. As we take communion, I want you to prayerfully, don't open them yet, I can hear it. Um, I want you to prayerfully ask Jesus and ask this seriously. Lord, how would you like me to respond to the freedom that you have given me? So he died on the cross for our freedom. What are we doing with it? Let's ask that in prayer now and then reflect on it in a minute as we take communion. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning and we pray the prayer found at the end of Psalm 39. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Search us, Lord. And Lord, hear our prayers as we open our lives to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, these annoying cups that we have that make that ripping and tearing sound when we open them. Don't open them yet. (laughs) It's kind of fitting this morning. Communion in and of itself is the act of reopening our lives to remember the sacrifice of Jesus and respond accordingly. So this morning, let's not open our cups until we are ready to open our lives. Karis is going to lead us in singing, Lord, I give you my heart. And as a symbol of opening your heart during the song, whenever you feel ready to do so, hold on to your cup, and whenever you feel ready to do so, open it as a symbol of opening your heart. Take the wafer out and eat it. Hold on to the cup, and we'll drink together after the song. Let's stand together and sing. And then as we do so, while you're singing, when you're ready, open your cup and take the wafer. Let's stand together and sing.
thanks that you moved first. And through that sacrifice of Jesus, we can walk in relationship to you. We drink this at your invitation. And as we do so, we open ourselves up to the repentance of Zacchaeus and ask you to change us, renew us, and use us to bless the world, just like you. We drink now with grateful hearts. Give ourselves afresh to you, Lord. Hear our prayers. In Jesus' name.